today, uh, that meant, and because we only had one day for our dev room, that meant that we only had a couple of uh, slots available for regular talks. So it was very difficult to have a regular talk uh, this time in our dev room. Uh, one of the talks that we did accept is the upcoming one, uh, which is on a topic that I think that many, many of us are very concerned about and is very important for our community. I'm really excited to introduce Ben Lindbergh, who's going to give us an update on this very important topic. Uh, thank you. I am, I'm glad to be here today. Can you all hear me? Perfect. So I want to... Uh, so, let's see. How do I move to the next one? Don't, don't shout because if we can't hear you on the mic, then it's not the recording will come up. Today. Gotcha. Um, so, what we're going to be talking about today is I'm going to give you as quickly as possible an overview of who is arguing what or what we think that they're going to be arguing. Sort of the overview of what's what's going on in the case, who's arguing what. Uh, the various positions that are being advanced, and then I'd like to just tie up with a few thoughts about how this might affect uh, affect free and open source software. So the first thing is I'm going to assume that um, this is where we are right now. All the argument, all the, the Google has filed its brief. Uh, Google has filed its brief. All the all the amicus briefs, they're called friend of the court briefs, either in favor of or in, in favor of Google or in, in support of neither party have been filed. Coming up very soon, we're going to have Oracle's brief and a week later, the briefs in favoring Oracle. Um, things have been set for arguments on, May, on March 4th, 24th, and then probably by June we'll have a decision. No matter what happens, this is probably going to affect the way all of our free software free and open source software licenses are interpreted. So a couple key concepts. I'm assuming that most people are going to be familiar with the, the ideas of fair use, of, of copyrightability. I've highlighted up here sort of the three key, two key concepts and one key case that is really, going to, uh, is really going to form the basis for what a lot of people are talking about. This first is this idea of copyrightability. Uh, Copyright covers creative expression. Uh, however, the same copyright statute says that it doesn't cover ideas, systems, methods of operation, functional things like that. So the big question is, are the declarations and the, the stru structure, sequence, and organization, the SSO of those, is that functional? Is that, uh, is that creative? How does that tie into the copyright statute? The second idea is fair, uh, fair use. Sometimes even things that are, would otherwise be uh, infringing are allowed because it advances a larger societal purpose. In the case of uh, Oracle v. Google, we're talking a lot about interoperability. We're talking about competition. But we're also talking about the, in, the broader purpose of incenting people to, to try and create new works, which is the purpose of copyright overall. Fair use is a balancing act between the rights of other people to use things in, in ways that you may not necessarily agree with if it serves a, more, a broader, more important societal purpose than the base purpose of copyright, which is to encourage more works. Finally, I'm going to be talking about a lot about a case called Baker v. Selden. This is a case from the late 1800s where a guy had a book where he described how a bunch of things work and he some forms in it to describe his accounting, his accounting system. Another guy published a different book. He used those same forms, got sued for copyright infringement. Went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, you have a copyright in the book, but your copyright does not extend to those forms. If you wanted to, if you wanted to protect those forms, you needed to get a patent. Uh, this was sort of the first time the Supreme Court embraced this idea expression distinction. And it went on to, uh, it, it went on to form the basis a lot of a lot of copyright jurisprudence today. So I want to talk for a moment about the framing that both Google and Oracle are uh, with which they're they're approaching this. Now Google so, some basic facts. Google took the entirety the work 
when we're talking about it, what's the work? It is the Java 2, it's Java 2 SE. Uh, it is, they took the entirety of this work, and particularly they took the declarations that formed the, that, that formed the API. They took 37 of them that they said, hey, these are going to be relevant for the mobile phone context. They took the declarations from that and copied those and then either wrote or used Apache Harmony to, to put in the implementing code. Those declarations and then the organization of them into the class structure is what we're talking about. Google's framing is that these declarations are entirely functional. This is really a system of operation. We really shouldn't be talking about copyright at all. And their main argument that they're really focusing on is this idea of merger. After, Google, after Oracle had created these Java packages, there was only one way for people to access the functionality, and that was by using the specific name and the specific organization that, that Oracle had prescribed. Therefore, this, this copyright concept called merger says there's really only one way to do it, so you can't tie that thing up by copyright. They've also said, it doesn't matter that we copied 11,000 of these. Uh, if you can copy one fact or one piece of functionality, you can copy 1,000. It doesn't matter. Uh, now looking, so that is broadly Google's framing. Google, in this context, Google is arguing a couple things on copyright. The first thing is that they are really going all in on the merger doctrine. And they said, Court, you can, or you can decide that this whole thing is a system of operation. But in their, in their case, they, but in their brief, they say, but if you would like to, to decide this on a narrower basis, and that is like catnip to the Supreme Court. They always like narrower bases for their decisions. Uh, you can say this, was, this is really controlled by the merger doctrine. There was really only one way to do this, and so therefore, the specific parts of the work that we copied were excluded from copyright, and it was OK. Um, the other thing is that they're saying that this really court is a great policy. This is something that is enabling people to create new works. This is something that is broadly accepted in the industry, and it is furthering the function of copyright. Google doesn't stop there because they've actually, the, the Supreme Court is actually going on two questions. They said, we are going to review both the copyrightability and whether this was fair use. And so Google's position on fair use is that, you know what, the jury, this really was a question for the jury, which is actually a really good point. And the jury said, this is fair use. The jury had a good reason. They heard hundreds of hours of testimony. They could, they could reasonably decide that this was fair use. And so there was really no reason to overturn what the jury said. Case closed. So even if you disagree with us on copyrightability, the jury could have decided this completely reasonably. On the other hand, Oracle's framing is, uh, is a little bit different. Oracle is saying, you know what, this is like a literary work. In fact, software itself is protected as a literary work. And so when we think about types of works, we talk about whether there's a thin copyright or whether there's a broad or a strong copyright. And the broadest, strongest copyright are for the things that show the most creativity. And court, this was hard. This was creative. And so we should have as broad a copyright as possible. And all those things that Google copied, that was essentially like copying all of the heading, chapter, head, chapter titles and headings and subheadings of a very long and complex book. And you can't really just copy part of that or copy the heart of something and, and say, well, we didn't copy all of it. The fact is, there was creativity in the organization of this, and it was, it was expressive in the way that we put it together. Um, with regard to, with regard to uh, fair use, they're also talking a lot about the, uh, the, this idea of the creativity and the work that they put into it. It is, uh, 
one of the core, use, core elements of fair use is that it shouldn't override and shouldn't displace the commercial prospects of the original author. Uh, it shouldn't displace the original work. Uh, and so they're saying, what we did is we created essentially a very popular literary work. We had millions and millions of fans, and they decided that this was something that they wanted to copy. Uh, Google's use was overwhelming commercial, overwhelmingly commercial, and it was used for the exact same purpose. It doesn't matter that you change the context. If you read a book, if, if you read a book here and you read a book on stage, it's still the same book. They, and it was still the exact same content. So that is Oracle's overall framing. Um, I also want to uh, uh, note this, this. This was their brief in opposition. One note about all these things about Oracle. As I noted, they haven't actually filed their brief with the Supreme Court yet. So what I would di did is I went back and I pulled all the briefs from Oracle at all the different stages of the case. And I also pulled all of the people who filed in support of Oracle at earlier stages in the case. So all the things that I'm, that I'm, that I'm quoting are things that were said either by Oracle or in support of Oracle at an earlier stage that I think are likely to come up when we see their, their full arguments in a week or two. Uh, but this idea, the bolded portion, Google's copying was equivalent of taking the most recognizable parts of a popular short story turning them into a blockbuster movie without the author's permission, something that the Supreme Court deemed a classic unfair use. So let's think about this for a moment. What do we know? As I mentioned, the Supreme Court granted certiorari on both questions. Now, for those who are not legal geeks, um, and I realize that may be only half of you in this audience, but... Uh, <laughs> So when someone goes up to the Supreme Court, they have what they call questions presented. What are the things that we want you to decide, Supreme Court? And they usually put up one or two. And the Supreme Court doesn't have to take the case at all. Or if it takes the case, it can specify, we're only going to talk about question one, or we're only going to talk about question two. Now, procedurally, Oracle v. Google is very interesting, because it came up to the Supreme Court once before. The Supreme Court thought about taking it. And they on copyrightability, and they said, "Nah, we'll send it. We're not going to take it now." It went down. They had the trial on fair use. It came up again, and the Supreme Court said, "Okay, we'll look at it this time." <coughs> they decided to accept on both the original question of copyrightability as well as the second question on fair use. So, if the court takes. Uh, grant certiorari, and it's particularly on a particular question, that means at least four of the nine justices think that there is an important uh, principle that needs to be addressed. Uh, so you've got at least four people who say this, both the copyrightability and the fair use questions are worthy of being looked at. Uh, the, I also want to uh, look at sort of their framing. Google's argument on merger it maps really well to the copyright statute. And you've got a lot of people on the Supreme Court, a lot of the justices, who very much like to be grounded in the text of the statute. And 17 U.S.C. 102b talks about, hey, in no way, way does copyright extend to any idea, system, uh, system function, me uh, method of operation, et cetera. It's easy to say, see how software can fit into that. The, Issue, though, is that they're putting all their eggs in this merger basket. And Oracle's argument on merger is very subtle, but I think it's powerful. Oracle's argument on a merger is that for merger to apply, it has to apply what's called ex ante, beforehand. There only has to be a couple ways to express this in the first place. They've said, you know what? Actually, Oracle had thousands of ways to express this. And really, there, was, there were constraints only because Google wanted to tap into Oracle's market. That's a, powerful mar that's a powerful argument that in some cases, various a lot of these things haven't been litigated, but various people have said that is one of the times when merger doesn't necessarily apply. Uh, the also, however, various amici have made arguments that reach the same conclusion via other, other routes. So, 
it's not necessarily 100% on just the Oracle v. Google main arguments. The other thing that I want to point out is that this idea in the second case, there was a jury verdict for fair use that was overturned and ruled as no possible jury could have ever come to that conclusion by the federal circuit. That thing is incredibly rare and arguably fairly improper. I think that that is the wild card that's really going to, that is going to be the hardest thing to overcome, even if copyrightability and fair use go for Oracle. So um, I just went through this. Uh, so let's look, let, let's go forward through the, uh, uh, let, let's go forward through the various amici. 26 amici, I believe, filed either in support of Google or in support of neither party. Um, this particular organization was done by the Disco Project. I thought it was very helpful uh, in terms of just showing the range of different people who were interested and weighed in on this particular issue. I'm going to, I've grouped them a little bit differently, though, and I'm going to go through and, and group them by the types of arguments that they made. So, uh, so first were arguments regarding copyrightability. First one I'd like to really highlight is the, uh, the amicus brief by Pamela, Pamela Samuelson and 72 IP scholars. This was just a tour de force of completely deconstructing the, 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 law, of the, the law of copyright, how it applied from Baker v. Selden forward, this is something that, that uh, Professor Samuelson has focused on her entire professional life. And this is an incredibly powerful, well-researched, well-argued uh, focus on the copyrightability question. Uh, not surprisingly, she, because she's our, filing in favor of Google, she says Google should win this one. Also notable on arguments regarding copyrightability is the ones by Manel, Nimmer, and uh, Valganache. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, a lot of you people may not know, there is a famous treatise called the Nimmer on Copyright. It gets quoted by courts all the time. This Nimmer, it was actually his dad who started, but he's been writing that treatise since 1985. So when people quote Nimmer on Copyright, that is that Nimmer. And he also said, you know what, this is this is not correct under copy, under the copyright statute. It's like if Kernighan weighs in on C. Say again? It's like if Kernighan weighs in on C. Yeah, it's like Kern, if Kernighan weighs in on C. <laughs> um, it's, it's that heavy a, a weight. Uh, IBM and Red Hat uh, st stepped up and they argued. Um, uh, they argued pretty... Uh, pretty straightforwardly that these things should be excluded from copyright. They were probably the only one that had an exclu a, a quite a bit of discussion about uh, Paris v. Hexamer. That's a really fun case. It was about uh, the copyright on a map and whether, the, whether you could copyright the symbols that you use to indicate different types of development on a map. And the court said, no, you can't. And they said, this is the same thing. Uh, a lot of people uh, in this room, that, uh, a lot of were associated with some of the briefs here. These were essentially the open source organization related briefs. Uh, the, uh, the PSF, Tidelips, Open UK, and Protocol Labs brief said, you know what? We already have this concept for a mixed work, uh, of a mixed work in copyright. It is a useful article. You've already thought about how to separate useful articles from copyrightability stuff. Just apply that test. The, uh, the long list of people uh, in, on the Mozilla brief um, said, you know what, this, is, this was both half of a policy brief and half of a copyrightability brief. They said, software developers rely heavily, heavily on the ability to reimplement. This is one of the key tools in, our, key tools in the, the toolbox. It has been accepted as, uh, accepted as okay. And so, following Baker v. Selden, this should be allowed. One of the most surprising briefs was actually by the AIPLA. That stands for the American Intellectual Property Law Association. They are traditionally very, very pro-IP, pro-strong IP. 
they technically filed in favor of neither party, but their arguments were basically that Google should, Google should win. Uh, in fact, I had to check that it was actually in favor of neither party because it came out so strongly in terms of saying that really these things should be excluded from copyright. Um, that is going to be a name that is well known by the justices and the fact that they weighed in in such a definitive way is going to be influential. The EFF also uh, weighed in saying that the, they, excluded, they excluded a bunch of 102B. Now, turning over to fair use, if you want to look at sort of the definitive fair use, uh, fair, fair use amicus brief, it is uh, Professor Rebecca Tushnitz and 17 Law Professors uh, uh, brief. They went through and they completely sort of eviscerated the Federal Circuit's logic in terms of the, the, the rebalancing of the fair use factors. There are four fair use factors. They said, you know what, they got them wrong on all of them. Also particularly notable here is the brief by Microsoft. The brief by Microsoft was very well done, but the important thing here for, from the justices' perspective is that the justices know Microsoft. They know, like, Red, like IBM as well, but especially Microsoft, who filed on the opposite side of this at an earlier point in the case, they know that Microsoft relies on a well-functioning copyright system for software. And so having Microsoft weigh in and say, yeah, this is a little bit messed up, really, really uh, is going to be very influential. Notably, they filed on the fair use question where their earlier, their earlier amicus brief at the Federal Circuit was pro-copyrightability of these interfaces. So they are not necessarily backing down from that position, but they are saying that fair use should make these, thing, these APIs available. Moving on, there are procedural arguments. I mentioned that this was the overturning of a, of a jury argument. These people said, you know what, this is a, this was procedurally just terribly messed up. You should, you should overturn and reverse on this ground alone. And then you come to a lot of different policy arguments. Um, I've grouped these in terms of various, uh, various themes. A lot of people said, this has been essentially the law for decades. You're going to be overturning a lot of settled expectations. Um, this group of people were saying interoperability is a core benefit that we were that fair use is designed to to enhance. Um, if you both the, both in terms of copyrightability and in terms of fair use, if we don't allow this sort of competitive reuse to occur, we're going to lose the benefits of interoperability. Wow, I'm almost out of time. A um, couple more anti-competitive uh, anti -competitive conduct uh, from the American Antitrust Institute and the Retail Litigation Center. Um, and uh, against the expansion of copyright. Now I want to, um, a couple of things, the American Library Association and some others said don't mess up fair use. Um, I'd like to look for a moment while I've got just a, just a minute. Who were the people who might support Oracle? And while this is just my guess, this is not actually the list of amici, these are people who seem to have expressed interest or have filed at various earlier points. So this is my guess of people who might support Oracle. And what are some of these people, what have they said? Um, you'll find that a lot of this Writing APIs is a powerful, powerfully creative endeavor. You should not say, just because this is software, this should get less copyright concern. Uh, um, it is, it's uh, bad, pol bad policy. The BSA is probably going to weigh in, and the IP scholar is saying, this is, a, this is a property right, and you should make sure that you reinforce the copyrightability of software, because that is the basis of the entire software industry. I'd like to point out that to a certain extent, we actually agree with that from a FOSS standpoint. We rely on the enforceability of copyright for all of our favorite licenses. Um, 
a, there's a lot of people who look like they're probably going to weigh in on fair use, saying what Google did actually directly displaced Oracle's product in the market. And because it displaced Oracle's product in the market, we are really, it is something that, that is something that fair use has never allowed. Um, so I've got about one minute. I want to give a, cu a couple of closing, uh, closing thoughts. This is one of those things where, why does this matter? It matters because the interaction of software with interfaces is something that we deal with all the time. It's an uneasy place for copyright. Uh, very concretely, think about the inclusion of an API or the use of an API similar to the use of like including a header file when you're dynamically linking. If Oracle's position is correct, then there's a good argument that dynamically linking is no different than statically linking from a GPL2, per, GPL2 GPL3 perspective. Uh, whereas if, uh, if Google's position, the strong Google position is correct, that moves, for example, the LGPL and the GPL much closer together in terms of their actual effect. Um, this is something that affects lots and lots of different, uh, different products. It also affects all these services, all these web APIs. Now, it could be that a particular API is not creative enough to, for someone to say, yes, this is, uh, this is copyrightable. But the default is going to be we're going to need to start thinking about every API and every network call as a possible source of license control. Excellent. Questions? <laughs>